little uh, outline on the board last time. If you didn't get it, you should get it this time. <clears throat> um, the beginning, the revelation, the declaration, the gathering, and then the spread of the message. And we were sharing about this, how it is um, related to a spiritual uh, progression that the scriptures lay out in uh, the Gospel of John, the first chapter. It is uh, the beginning. It is, uh, it shows the progression from beginning to end in a microcosm. <clears throat> um, you don't have to understand the whole Bible in that sense, because first of all, who understands the whole Bible? Uh, but there are places and there are, uh, that the scriptures will give you the, the DNA of the whole. And I believe that John is one of those people who does that. And I believe he does it because he, uh, he started from the beginning. And so his, um, and uh, we talked about this and it will be a major subject to be discussed uh, in the uh, class called the Four Gospels, if I should teach it. <clears throat> But uh, each, of the, uh, each of the writers starts their gospel with a particular point of origin or a point of beginning. And I think that's significant, and it's significant to the, to the angle of each writer, because each writer, see, there are four gospels, and we say, well, why do we have four? I mean, it's all repeating the same stuff. I mean, you know, but it's not. It's not. It is different angles of this Jesus that we know and it is so so cool and John is one of those who he goes all the way back to the beginning not the beginning in this life not the beginning for you not the beginning of Israel but he takes it back before creation and there he sees where everything emanates from so that everything has meaning only in light of the beginning and, and I mean true meaning, fullness. I like that word, and the scriptures use that word a lot, fullness, fullness, you know, from which we get the word fulfillment. Uh, and, and I believe that, um, you know, to me, Christianity is, and not really Christianity, but we'll say it that way, Christianity is, man, I mean, how could anybody be discontent? Well, I'll tell you why because they haven't found the fullness of what it's all about, and so they become discontent. They, they were told that once you got saved, that was it. And there are many, many people and denominations that teach this way so that every Sunday you just come and either get re-saved or, or preached a salvation message, and that is because they have started their beginning at the wrong point. And it's a good point if, if you're excited and you're newly saved and you know what I mean? And you're truly thankful and all this kind of stuff. But it's, it will never keep you through everything. And so what, what do we do? We back up from there and we go, okay, well, there's got to be something more. And so we say, oh, what you need is the full gospel. And the full gospel is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So we get baptized in the Holy Spirit and we will operate some gifts and we do some things and we go, whoa, this is really great. This is it. And we enjoy that for a while. And then after a while we get kind of bored and whatever, you know. And, and uh, uh, so <clears throat> what begins to happen is a yearning that is really not on the surface level or not on a temporal level. Now, you know, salvation uh, was, if you will, it has, it has eternal effects, but it was temporal in time. It saved you from hell, if you will. But, but something of eternal value is what, what most of us call eternal life. Salvation is not eternal life. At salvation, we receive him who is eternal life. But we don't know him who is eternal life. And John even talks about this. You can read his letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, uh, even in, in his gospel. He says, and this is eternal life, that you may know God the Father and the one whom he sent. So it's wrapped up in this beginning, this father-son uh, relationship. But, but let me tell you, for the most part, your reaction to that is not based on a son toward a father. 
your reaction to that is based on the father's understanding of you as a son we keep trying to be a son toward a father you know we go oh if that's it then i'll you know but see it's not it, it is un, it's all understood in how the father views the son jesus christ in whom we are and who he put in us in whom we are now that in him paul said this in him we live you know, not in some uh, ambiguous kind of way, maybe, maybe for some, but not for Paul. Uh, in him we live and move, meaning uh, I like the I like the term move because it 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 uh, has a connotation. It connotes um, motivation. To something moves you, and uh, frankly. The churches, the, the churches are looking now for something that will move them. <laughs> well, I know something that will move them. But it's a person, and they have to realize in whom they are and who is in them, and the relationship that they have with the Father, and I guess I need to draw him up there, but the relationship they have with the Father is through this union with the Logos, and I like using that term a lot more than Son, because... And I think there's no greater reason than this. Because we very quickly pervert sonship. We very quickly pervert sonship. Because we make sonship simply a title slapped on us who have gotten saved and, you know, whatever. Whereas... In reality, the scriptures never even use the term sonship. But it uses the term the son over and over and over. You have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the son of his love. This is my beloved son. And all of those, that means we don't find fulfillment. This is the beginning before we ever were. That means we don't find fulfillment except in the beginning and as viewed by the Father because, and I, I, I don't really mean to get into this, but because true fulfillment is never found in discovering who you are. It is found in giving and pouring out and sharing and blessing and true, true fulfillment is found not in getting and gaining and knowing and receiving. It's not. It's not. And I can, I can prove, prove this to you by showing you the Godhead and how they operate one with another. And the way that they operate is not in a selfish uh, cover my end, you cover your end. It's always the other one is covering, you know, the Holy Spirit sent of God after Jesus is resurrected. The Holy Spirit doesn't declare himself. He just declares Jesus. Jesus comes, he won't declare himself. He declares the Father. It is a totally selfless thing. But we call it sonship. And we pervert it because we say, I'm a son of God. <laughs> you know, I'm a son of God. Uh, I'm, uh, or, or, or the son of God is for me, or whatever. Something like that. But somehow, we break the flow of the Godhead. We break the flow of this oneness. And that's really what it is. It is total oneness. It is one. It is one. They're one as they operate in this manner uh, the angels were, were tried to be brought into that oneness but they couldn't handle it man was tried to be brought into it he couldn't handle it I mean the angels were you know uh, uh, I've often said this but uh, uh, Lucifer you know and some people uh, argue the point but uh, uh, I believe that uh, Satan was uh, a fallen angel a fallen cherub if you will and I believe that uh, he came in, and I, see, I, th I think those scriptures over there in Ezekiel 38 and Isaiah 14 do have reference to him. And, I, I, you know, people can argue from all sorts of angles, but I believe based on the spirit that is described there and the spirit that is at work in this world, and, I, and that is, now you are of your father the devil, I don't think there's any question about it. I think, you know, one of these classes... Uh, uh, if we ever make it to chapter 5, I'm going to really show you that um, that the uh, uh, Pharisees and everybody quoted Scripture left and right. 
scripture, scripture, scripture. Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, here's the spirit of what that thing's all about. You know, well, but they were quoting, well, scripture, and that's enough, isn't it? No. You know, to know the spirit, not the letter. You know, to be motivated by the spirit, not the letter. <clears throat> so, you know, I believe that... Uh, he, he came in, he was an unfallen angel, and he was in there, and I believe God treated him just like he treats everybody else. The scriptures say, Thou art the anointed chair. Thou art beautiful in all thy ways. Thou art, you know, only he didn't say it nonchalantly. I believe he said, You are the anointed chair. You are beautiful. You are all the things that the scriptures declare of him. And I believe he heard that every day. And, of course, he, I think at first, before he fell, that he acknowledged God. Yeah, holy, 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 and da 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 da, and all this stuff. But one day, that turned inward. And he said, I will be like the Most High God. I will. You can find that. What is that? Uh, Isaiah 14. I will exalt myself into the throne. I will. It keeps using the term I, I. That's independent self. I will become something. He turned before that time, before the fall, he said, holy is the Lord, great is the Lord, you know. And, you know, your whole nature doesn't ride with this. You can sin and get forgiveness. You can, during the day, get your eyes off the Lord. You can get your eyes on you through several, you know, really a million different mediums of self-pity or self-righteousness or self-glorying or whatever. But it all relates to an inward gaze, an inward look. Gaze meaning not, not just the gaze according to the scriptures, the, the Greek translation, uh, not just a glance, but to behold. I really like that word. To behold and to look within and see... There are people discouraged because they say, I don't see Jesus in me. I mess up all the time. I don't, and they're looking right here. And so that look and that failure causes them to work harder, which causes them to look more closely. And so there's, it's, a, it's a, like a grease slide. You get on this thing of, you know. But how many of you have been down and out, discouraged, really fearful, and somehow through some means got your eyes back on the Lord to look at the Lord and go glory and just the cloud lift and you just you know and you just go well, how did that work and a lot of times we don't know how it works what we think is God just touched us and maybe God did just touch you but he touched you to get your eyes off of you to him and all we remember is the touch so now we're self-centered next time we get down and out we need a new touch you understand what I'm saying? But, but he touched you so that you might look at him and go, oh, you know, and, and, and like it or not, this is one of the true benefits of praise and worship if done properly, you know. <clears throat> There's two ways to get happy during a, during a praise and worship service. One is to get in the, get in the soul and just go, ah, yeah, you know, and you're going, and you'll feel better if you just jump and shout and dance around and, you know, do backflips off the wall and stuff. You'll... You know, I mean, just the, just the adrenaline flow and the blood finally getting areas in you that hadn't been there in a long time will make you feel better. That's not necessarily the Lord, and, and, and uh, we know that, but not everybody knows that. But there's another way, and that is truly to turn your eyes, which may mean getting, not, not getting your eyes off of your bummed out self and try to pump your self up, which is a self, see, you know what I mean? Now I'm a happy self, you know, but rather to get your eyes on the Lord, and you know, David is a perfect example of that, you know, he's bummed out on oh, my enemies are coming against me, da 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 oh, you know, he's all cast down and everything, and then he says, but thou, O Lord, and when he starts talking about the Lord, he gets his, he lifts his eyes, and then he begins to rejoice before he sees any victory, because and this is where it gets tough. His victory is the Lord. Now that's different than the Lord giving you the victory. 
but we're always wanting the Lord for us, for something. Be happy, get rid of mean old boss, da da da, Lord, help me. You're my helper. You're my helper, you know. And that's self centered. And so, you know, in God's gracious, and He does all kind of good stuff. So He might even touch your old self centered flesh and help you. You know, He does. He's, he's really, really good, and He's done that to me so many times I can't tell you. But there came a day when I didn't want to, to have my relationship based with Him based on that. I learned, I, or began, I certainly have not finished, but I began to learn to identify in the complete thought and concept of God. Not just being a son of God. Oh, I'm just a son of God. It's a new teaching. It's a happier teaching, or it's a better teaching. See, that's still not it. But to find yourself in the logos, the complete thought and concept of God, and there be identified, is to find yourself accepted. If you believe the word. If you don't believe the word, then you don't feel accepted and you don't think you're accepted because you don't feel accepted at the moment. Why, they looked at me funny. Somebody thought something. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? If you don't feel accepted, you can read things a million different ways. Let me tell you this. If you have problems with acceptance, don't ever become a preacher for many reasons. One is... Uh, or, or you're being a worship leader because it'll bum you out if you look at people's faces. <laughs> you know? I mean, and somebody may just be sitting there like this, kind of going like this, and they look mad, and they're really just thinking about what you've said, and they're really kind of trying to <laughs> lay hold of that one there, but they're kind of looking like this, and you go, oh, my God, they're all mad at me. Uh, you know, I don't know why they're mad at me. Why are you preaching? You can go off on all kinds of stuff. But if your acceptance is here, if they're mad at you the, and your heart is right and you don't want them to be mad at you and you can find out later and you find out that they're not or they were or whatever, that's, but your acceptance with the Father is settled and you just flow with that. And you learn that in Him you live and move and have your being and there is such security that you cannot imagine apart from that realm. Because we live in this realm, it's always shaky. For a while, it goes along well, but it's always shook, isn't it? Ricky? Yeah, I was sitting back in class, and then 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 I was sitting back in class, and Amen. Well, you know, and I realize, too, when I say get your eyes on Jesus, there are, you know, 25 different connotations of that. You know, oh, I need to get my, I, my eyes back on the one who has always come through for me when I need it. Or, you know what I mean? I mean, really, honestly, uh, you do the best you can with the words, but there's no way. I mean, only the Holy Spirit can break through this veil of what was always and always will be, was and is and is to come. I mean, the good thing it is assured. You know, it's not something that we even, we just enter into by faith. It's not something that we have to attain to or whatever. But only the Holy Spirit can bring you through that. And of course, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent. And that, it didn't say now at that moment when your will turned to the Lord, it was your heart. 
and that is a I can't I don't want to preach about the heart today so um, that is a um, basic decision I'll just say it like that <laughs> instead of just a little daily decision that you make it's a basic path decision if you will <clears throat> um, okay so we talked about there was the beginning and that's what we've been discussing okay then we talked about the revelation to an individual and John was one of those who began to see that reality and uh, uh, and as he began to see it you know he began to minister but there are and there are uh, two kinds of declarations they came to him at one point and uh, they said uh, this was you know who are you and what are you all about and all this kind of stuff and this is not truly a declaration to the hungry this is more of you know somebody's trying either through flattery or pressure or whatever and you know you got a lot of weaknesses that you will respond i mean i do we do we have a lot of weaknesses that the right pressure and whatever will make you go you know yeah i'm somebody or i you know whatever um <clears throat> but he said you know first of all he said i am not i am not i am not i mean he had seen the, the logos the complete thought and concept of god i mean once again if you see Jesus as the Logos, the complete thought and concept of God, then they say, who are you? You will go, I'm not. What, what is it you wanted me to be? Are you the prophet? I'm not. Are you da-da-da? I'm not. Are you? I'm not. He is all. He is everything. But see, they didn't ask, well, who is the one you're here to declare yet? They were just asking him about him. So finally they said, well, then who are you? If you're not, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not, we don't want to know anymore what you're not we want to know what you are and he said i am the voice of one the logos the complete thought and concept of god i'm the voice of that the big one the one not even the big one the one i'm the voice of one very singular my ministry's not difficult i'm not confused <laughs> I know what I'm about. I have I'm to declare the one that is because I am not. And guess what? You are not, and you are not, and none of us are. But He is, and the, and the good thing is, He is that to the Father, and He's the one that accepts us based on this. So He says, "I'm I am the voice of one." All right. But then there's another declaration that He has to make. Um, let's see I guess we could go ahead and start at verse 29 John chapter 1 verse 29 the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world this is he of whom I said after me cometh a man who is preferred before me for he was before me uh huh see he, he didn't just mean uh, he is um, omniscient and immutable and you know what I mean he wasn't spouting doctrines here uh, he was before and after and it is the you know some great terminology he uses for that he's saying look this guy was before me and going to be long after me because he's the one the logos of God you see what I mean it's, it's very practical it's it's smart men that have made this hard you know the gospel is so simple you you got to really work at it to mess it up it's just one and we work at it very diligently with much effort thinking and everything always trying to figure out but it's just this one so he just says he is he was before me and he is preferred before me so i'm the voice of that one Verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but, the, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. Because everybody gets a little anointing every once in a while. I see it a lot. I see it on me. I see it on you. But the, the Spirit 
will and can. You know, most of us would like to have some sort of a steady life in the Lord. I believe that. Most of us really would like a steadiness. Well, I'm trying to tell you how. The Spirit descends and remains on Him. If we keep our focus there, the Spirit of God will always and forever move there. It's the truth. Whereas there are waves of the Spirit and He'll fall on that, but after a while He may not fall on that anymore. You know, tent meetings, tent meetings, tent meetings. After a while, He don't fall on tent meetings and they roll up their tents. You understand what I'm saying? But the Son, the Logos, the one who was and is and is to come, guess what? The Holy Spirit will always fall and remain on Him and you never have to doubt that. And if you would like to be in touch with because that's the Holy Spirit, you would like to be in the flow, that's how to get into the flow. Because it never changed, and it never will change. Whereas these other things may. And God may use you in those things. He may use you over years through many waves. But the one thing that is not a wave, it is a constant. He was before me. He is the third before me. He is Alpha. He is Omega. I saw and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Verse 35. Again, the next day John stood... And two of his disciples, okay, John's got two of his disciples there. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. These were two of John's disciples. He's, he's the one that saw. And then he's the one who begins to declare him to, his, to those who, who gathered to hear it, but because they just came to hear it, another gathering begins to take place, and it says, and they follow Jesus, and this is the beginning. Uh, I wrote, the formation of the body has begun with Jesus as the center. Behold the Lamb of God, and they walked off from John and said, okay, we're going this way. You know, now Christ is in the center, and later on they said, John, what's the deal? I mean, you know, you're, you're the big hot shot prophet of the day, uh, Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more than you. And he said, I told you he must increase and I must decrease. I'm not shocked by this. I'm not upset. You know, it never was meant to be a gathering around me. It never was. The gathering is not, you know, the head, you gather around the head, you know. And that's what it was always about. And I'm not shocked. Or, are you? You know? Um, especially if the whole time John's saying, there's one preferred before me, I'm not worthy to latch, unlatch his shoelaces. I mean, he is da-da-da-da. You know, he, that's the way he always talks. He always points to Jesus. He's, he says, you know, this, uh, you know, it's like the, 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 the best man, you know, uh, uh, always points toward tw the bride, towards the, the man she's going to marry, you know, pointing here. He's always saying that. He's always pointing there. He's always pointing that and all that. And, and all of a sudden, people began to be drawn to the Lord and began to know the Lord and began to have a strength on their own, and, and, but not on their own, but with Him and one another now. And there's a decrease as well as an increase. And when that takes place, He's not shocked. Everything He declared was, I'm not, I'm not, He is, I'm not, He is, I'm not, I always said, I'm not, I'm not. It only becomes a shock to those who have not realized what the message is. They, they, you know, with the going forth of the message, there is, uh, there is a, 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 your spirit bears witness that this is the Lord. Uh, God does things. I mean, there is, he, he, he confirms the word with signs through many different ways. I mean, he, he supports what he has established and all that. But in truth, it's always been this one to whom, you know, and we quoted this scripture last time, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. You know? And that's li the lifting up of Christ and him crucified, not just declaring of a salvation Jesus. That is, I mean, he said, this spoke he concerning his death. You know, I mean, this lifting up is more than just, well, lift, let's lift up old brother so-and-so, he's down. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, he's down because he's in the flesh. Let's lift him up there on the cross with Jesus and let him be crucified and his flesh won't be down anymore. 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, if we really took it literally, now let's, let's don't take it literally because we'd all be bummed out or something, you know. I wouldn't be bummed out. I think that that is the answer. I think that's God's answer, and I believe it's a glorious answer because it is that, that body that is you, that flesh that is you, is like having an old dead body tied to you. And this is the way Roman, the Romans, if you killed a man, they'd tie that dead body to you and walk around, and it'd rot, and it'd rot you. You know, and it's like carrying around all that weight and all that junk, and you know, and yet somebody points you to the cross and you go, "No, man! I mean, you're you're dead already. You know what I mean? And dying in the process. And uh, no, man, I don't want to hear that. No, you know, and yet you drag yourself, and uh, I don't know how. You know, <laughs> and you just go, "Hey, man, it's just real easy. You just you just identify yourself, and the, and the neat thing is, you didn't even die. He died." He did the dying for you. You didn't even die. You know why? Because we can't even do that right. But he did. Thank God he did and does. I mean, he did die and, and, and it's settled. So the formation of the body has begun with Jesus as the sinner because while they were disciples of John, they weren't really a true representation of the body until Jesus was in the center. Can't be. So it doesn't matter, you know, everything is a dry run, dress rehearsal, practice, until we get it right. Oh, if you only knew what I just said. That we've been in a dress rehearsal. <clears throat> dry run, practice run, until Christ is in the center and the, those that gather for sure around Christ. Not just around the messenger, but around Christ. It's just it's still practice. <clears throat> People have begun to be drawn as a direct result of preaching the word, the logos. I am not, he is. That's preaching the logos. The thought, but he's preaching that from the Father's viewpoint. Let me say another thing. Folks, we say Jesus is everything. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. Folks. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how close you are to the Lord. I don't care how much you want the truth. He is not the Logos to you. He is the Logos to the Father. Your message isn't necessarily, I mean, your testimony may be what he is to you, but your message is what he is to the Father. And this gives you strength beyond what, what you know or what you've laid hold of for yourself because you have seen that relationship and you and I, I challenge you check Paul's writings you know I mean he's the one that says you know stuff and he's always linking these to blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory who has blessed us with all you know he doesn't even get in there and go you know and I've been real I've been doing real good and that's why I'm preaching this man he never does that he's not dumb we're dumb because we want to get in there or we we're trying to Oh, I feel like a hypocrite if I preached it that way because he ain't everything to me. I mean, I want him to be, but he ain't. I know he ain't, so I'm just, the only thing I can preach is the salvation gospel without being a hypocrite. No, that's not true. You preach that which he is to the Father. And you preach that which the Father is to you by Christ or that which the Father is to the Son. Same difference same difference and and I, I challenge you go through John go through John and just start marking every time the father is mentioned and and you're not <laughs> you know and but that somehow you're included in it you know Jesus always seems to get you in there but he he's really you're not the subject you're kind of the one that's being acted upon you're the indirect object you know but you're not the subject So people have begun to be drawn as a direct result of preaching the word, the logos, not just the scriptures. The Pharisees preached the scriptures. John preached the word. There are many people that can tell you all kind of stuff about the scriptures. But only the Father and only the Holy Spirit knows the logos, and they're the only ones that can break the bread of life to you. They're the only ones. You can study and should study through every means possible. Every uh, uh, Bible dictionary and, and uh, 
studies on the land of Israel and the, the customs and the ways and everything. We present all of those, the Greek, we present all of these different things. But ultimately, knowing all that is not the answer. Ultimately, because, because, you know, shall we say that the Pharisees knew the Greek, especially the Hellenistic ones? That was the language of the world at that time, Greek. I mean, you know, they weren't like studying Greek. It was their language, that and Hebrew. They didn't study Hebrew. That was their languages. They needed the Lord and they needed the Holy Spirit. Now, we studied and I've studied all of that. And I still study, you know, customs. That's another area. Customs of the land and of the times. There are many things to be learned from it. But you'll never know this. You'll know a lot of things. You can learn a lot of things. But you'll never know this except the Holy Spirit rents the veil. Really, not even the Holy Spirit rents the veil. It is the cross that rents the veil. When you, when you see the cross the way you're supposed to, you will understand. And that's all because Jesus is the one who said, at that day you'll know that I am in the Father and Father's in me and you in me and I in you. At that day. That wasn't a sal day of salvation. He was talking about the day that the Holy Spirit showed you what happened at the cross. No man, mo no man made program. Oh, sorry, we're talking about everybody being gathered together, the body finally being formed together. No man made programs have been necessary. And yet, anybody that's ever thought about being in the ministry has has started planning what they would do and how they would form it and how they could keep it and. What they would do different from everybody else, you know, well, I would, I'd give away free balloons to the kids every Sunday. We'd be so full of parents that had money, you know what I mean? Because the kids would say, we got to go to that church, I got to have a balloon. But we're jumping ahead to the second chapter. <coughs> uh, <coughs> when he drives the money changers out. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and see, now I believe each church and each, I believe God shows you specific little uh, temporal things that make that are that, that identify you you know i mean i really do i, I believe uh, i believe god was the one who showed larry lee about to pray for an hour in the morning I, I really do i mean i believe that i i i believe a lot of other people thought it was a method when to him it wasn't a method he heard from god obeyed god boom got the results i think everybody else made it a method or many others more than didn't and basically what they got out of it was, you know, like a lot of real long, tired days because they got up so early. <laughs> you know? and, um, but, um, but I believe that there are many things that God shows you. But, but see, I mean, I can't cover all bases of everything preaching. You, you know better than that. I'm not talking about those special things that God shows you. I'm talking about, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those things that uh, Brian was saying those imaginations where we start making plans, where we start thinking things, where we start comparing, and the Bible, Paul said, don't compare yourselves among yourself, but we compare ourselves and we say, well, if I was a leader, I'll tell you. And I know how you do that because, you know, I did it, and I think we're all of the same fallen race. I mean, I did it. I remember when I was an assistant pastor and the pastor was up there and just about everything he did, I thought I weighed and evaluated and said, you know, if I was in charge, I would do that different. I mean, I did. And I said, oh, boy, I'll do this and I'll do that and whatever. And I found out that nothing, that, I mean, even if you do it right, doesn't guarantee anything. First of all, the times change, the people change, the moods change. I mean, all kind of stuff becomes different. So you get it all planned out in the natural, and it still isn't going to work. And if it works, it's not really going to work because it's not going to have life behind it. And this was one of the things that I, I found out is the Lord told me, I, you know, for a long time I kept trying to take people who didn't have it in their heart to, 
seek the Lord who didn't have it in their heart to really get after and serve God, who didn't have it in their heart to reach the lost, who didn't have it in their heart to to uh, go anything beyond Sunday morning or Sunday night or something like that. Who, these things were not there. And I kept trying to put it in them. And I wore myself out. And the Lord said, quit it. Stop it. Quit doing it. Preach to those that already have it, and I'll bring more that have it in them, and all you'll be doing is lighting the fire I already put in them. You'll be like, blowing on it, and it'll go, yeah. Now, I know some of you have felt that way, that you've got this fire burning in you, and it wasn't, I didn't put it there, God put it there, but sometimes when I blow on that baby, it goes, you know, and that's because that's what the Lord told me to do. Find those that have it there, or they'll find you, or I'll see to it that they get to you. But I always thought, well, you could just put it into anybody. And the Lord told me, now maybe you're different, but he told me. And I, I went with it, and it's been okay since. To quit, I was wearing myself out. It's trying to, like, you know, it's trying to make a, a Japanese act like a, an American when he's never even been here before. You, you know, and you go, ooh, ooh, you, know, you don't even speak the language, you know. And you're, you're trying to explain this thing, and he cannot get it, you know. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, the, the key, once again, every time, over and over, the Holy Spirit to bring you into this. He's the only one that can fully bring you into it. <clears throat> okay, so, um, no man-made programs have been necessary. Now, I don't know that me saying this in this class is going to take that away from you. Uh, I would probably assume that it won't. I would assume that you must find out for yourself, and if that's necessary, you will. But you could just listen to what I said, take it before the Lord and say, is there any truth to it? You know what I mean? I mean? You could do that. But if you, you know, I mean, many of it, I didn't. I was hard. I probably heard it. You know what I mean? And just blew it off and said, oh, I don't know, man. My methods are going to be really good, you know. So whatever. I, you know, I mean, if you do, that's fine. You're not off from God. You're just kind of extending the length it's going to take to get where you need to be and probably working on some gray hair early you know that's cool you're looking at a guy that did it all every ounce of the way obviously i just came from my family reunion they ain't got no gray hair i got it all because i'm stupid <coughs> okay so a domino effect will take place now for once christ the lamb of god is preached from the word hungry hearts will begin to draw be drawn. So verse 40 through 42. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And he brought him to Jesus. Okay. So now the gathering, you see how the gathering starts happening? The, uh, the declaration comes, but... Uh, and we're fixing to see how it moves right into the spread. It, the, the declaration comes, and once that initial declaration comes, people begin to be drawn to Jesus, and what do they do? They begin to go to others and say, come, you know, we found the one, we found him. Um, and how did that word it? It was really good. And he brought him to Jesus, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, that's, that's terminology, too, that we use in the church a lot, bring this we want to bring somebody to Jesus. When maybe in the fullness of the scope, we're not bringing them to Jesus, we're bringing them to salvation. And they need to be brought to Jesus. They've had a salvation experience, but, you know, they feel good now because they're saved and they're not going to go to hell. And so, you know. But those that follow Jesus, Not, I didn't say those that got saved. I didn't even say those that were necessarily initially brought to Jesus and said, oh, I met, I met Jesus. I mean, those that followed Jesus, their time was pretty much filled up. They were busy following Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, well, okay, now you guys have all found me and you've been brought to me up. Uh, you know, go on now, you know, kind of do good, tell somebody about me every once in a while, you know, and we'll make this world a happier place together, 
No. You know, he, he was kind of funny, Jesus. You know, somebody would be brought to him and he'd say, uh, <clears throat> Oh, well, if any man's going to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and let's go. That's when he said, if you're going to follow me. Now, he didn't say, if you're going to be brought to me and get saved and walk off. But he said, if you're going to follow me, this is what's going to happen. You know? So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't even get into the argument of, well, are they saved or not saved if they're brought and then they go their own way. Uh, to me, to me, I'm not trying to just bring anybody to salvation. So that's not even a question to me. That never works in my mind, just bring them to salvation. When we go to Mardi Gras, when we go anywhere, when we go to minister, I want them saved, but I want to give them a bunch of literature and stuff. I want to try to bring them back with us if we can. I mean, I'll do anything. I want them to know and grow and keep going with the Lord. You know, and if they don't, and if we lead somebody to the Lord and they go off and I never hear from them again, I can't do anything about that. But I don't sit in my mind going, well, I wonder if they're saved anymore. I mean, my, goal, my one goal in life is to get people to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus is very specific. I, I did a search on it. In fact, I got a little brochure on it called, uh, what is it? Come on and follow Jesus. Wow. And it's just chock full of scriptures too, isn't it? It's just page after page, as a matter of fact. So that you don't even have to Look it all up, or you know what I mean? I mean, it just gives you scripture after scripture. Okay, following Jesus now is this. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And so, and I want people to follow Jesus because I know that if they follow him, they'll get to know him. And if they get to know him, they will uh, be a, eventually be a force for him. If they be a force for him, they will want to join with other people who are a force with him. And that group will begin to grow. And pretty soon they'll reach out and... Kind of like this. Anyway. All right, now we want to talk about the spread of the message. Now that someone else has seen Jesus, he also must declare him. Maybe we should take a break for it because this is a brand new in here and it has been an hour that you've been sitting here. So. Uh, let's take a little bit of break and then we'll come back. Okay, we're ready to talk about the spread of the message. Uh, we had read the uh, uh, scriptures in the first chapter there, verse 40, uh, 41. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. <clears throat> um so I, I read this statement, I think, last. Now that someone else has seen Jesus, he also must declare him. Okay, so you, you're beginning to get this um, orbital effect, if you will. The sun being in the, minute, in, the, in the center. And things starting to gravitate around him. Uh, kind of like the uh, solar system. You know, that has the sun in the center and, and things begin to find their pull from him. And uh, the whole thing is not just based on that particular drawing to him, but how that works in relationship to one another. <clears throat> so um, notice that Andrew first went to his own household. He first went to his own household, to his brother Simon. So Andrew is not just a hearer of the word spoken by John. In other words, he didn't just hear it and go, oh, this is good. There's something that begins to happen. Well, I mean, it's real obvious. The truth will make you free. I mean, if you really begin to hear something that is liberating, and this is one of the things that convinced me that many people have not heard is that you cannot, you cannot, you cannot keep your mouth shut. You must declare him. You will declare him because if you have found something that works, 
you will find your mouth opening up. You will, and, and I tell you what's interesting is that it's not that you say, oh my God, if that's true, then I should. It's not that. It's not a pressure you put on yourself. It's not a pressure somebody else puts on you. It is that you'll find yourself. You'll be sitting there talking to somebody and all this stuff will start coming out and you're going, I didn't know all that was, had gotten in there. I had no idea that that was, you know, making an impact on me. But here it is coming out of me. And, and of course, that cycle needs to continue. Continue to hear, continue to give out. And, and life is intake and give out. And just about anything, I mean, everything from plants to automobiles to everything else is intake and give a human body, the whole thing. Take in and give out. Take in and give out. Take in and give out. And that was one of the reasons why we said we didn't want a Bible school like, you know, Christ for the Nations or any of the others that where you just sit for three years. We wanted one where you could come and you could minister all the time. You could minister in many different ways. You could minister on major outreaches. You could minister in small ways through the different uh, things that we have going. Uh, you can minister to one another. You can minister by serving. You can minister by doing all sorts of things. And um, because I don't believe that you can just take in and take in and take in without ultimately just getting fat and then dying or something. You know what I mean? I mean, there has to be a take in and a give out. And, the, and if, you, if you learn um, uh, moderation and you learn balance, then you will learn when to take in and when to give out, and when to take in and when to give out. And, and you'll have, it will, it's like, what is breathing? It's taking in and giving out. I mean, it is a constant, and you're not sitting there going, oh, did I breathe that second? You know, you know, did I forget, you know, or something like that? And, um, I mean, we used to do that on drugs, but, you know, I forgot how to breathe, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but that shows that there's another influence there, you know. Um, Taking in and giving out, and that flow. Okay, so Andrew is not just a hearer of the word. He has seen the one of whom John spoke. Okay, it's different. He didn't just hear John speak. He has seen the one of whom John spoke. And they also must declare him. Those of like precious faith will be drawn together because of the life found in the word, being the logo center, the, the total concept. If you could, if you could think of, you know, it's uh, that doesn't even work for us because you go, well, if you think of the solar system and the sun being the center and everything, but see, we're all, we're so earthbound and we're pulled by gravity to this earth and we're all caught up with this. We don't realize that's the center. You know what I mean? I mean, we're the center as far as we're concerned, but we're not. You know, the sun is the center and the earth is just one of many, you know, just happens to be the one we're on, so that makes it important, you know. But it's really, it's really, uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, the earth could explode and uh, you, pretty much the universe would go on as normal. You know what I mean? Uh, if our sun explodes, I don't know about the universe, but I know that our little planet and us, you know what I mean, we would not be able to exist. You don't realize the priority. And I, the Lord's really having me say that to a lot of people, priority, priority. Priority. We don't realize the priority of God the Father toward His Son. And so we set other priorities. And it's real easy to do, and it's we're going to do it. You know what I mean? There's no need getting mad at somebody that does that um, because it's just, a, it's just a symptom or a proof. It's a proof that they haven't really seen the one that gives life and existence you know paul talked about that to them on mars hill i mean you know he's he is the source the source the logos the and 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 john said i'm the voice of one one i speak of one i've got one only to talk about <clears throat> so those of like precious faith will be drawn together because of the life found in the word and the chain reaction will continue and it is a chain reaction the scriptures show it as a chain reaction. This first chapter is from which the disciples and they were all came together from which where we came from ultimately. This is the, the outward working of the beginning working right on down to the spread. But it's not just a spread. It's a gathering in order to spread. And this is where many people miss it. 
They're wanting to spread. The, I'll, I'll go out and be a missionary, but there must be a gathering. And there, from that gathering, it was spread. You know, um, Paul didn't even sit there and go, you know, I really feel led. I think I'm going to go out into the ministry. The Holy Spirit came and put it on the hearts of the leaders and said, send this servant and that servant. And they ended up taking a bunch more with them, and they ended up traveling around. They were a body that traveled. It wasn't one or two. It wasn't three or four. You search the scriptures. They ended up being this big group. And uh, I like the way that they operated, too, as they went. They, he, Paul would send some over here, and he'd go over there, and, other go, and then they'd all meet back at so-and-so place and everything. I mean, they were just, this was this gathering that was spreading that was, when they came back, they'd introduce somebody new they picked up. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it was really cool. And Jerusalem was the same way, except they weren't traveling. They were when the persecution hit. <laughs> sent them all out. You know, but, uh, you know, they were preaching the word together. They were, in fact, I believe that it was a result of life that drew them that caused the spread. And I believe that anybody that doesn't recognize that will come up with a program to spread, and it may be a successful spread, but it is not uh, life. It's the only way I know how to put it. And it will eventually run its course like everything that is a program. It will eventually run its course. <clears throat> okay, so I said it will cause a, uh, the chain reaction will continue to knit the body together. Reading from verse 43 and verse 45. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Jesus found Philip, said, follow me. Verse 45 says, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You see, they're continuing to spread, but what is happening in the, even in the process of the spreading? A gathering is taking place. What is happening in the process of the gathering? A, per, a spreading is taking place. It's normal. It is normal it is, it is normal for life to give in, to, to take in and to give out. <clears throat> Therefore, you know that something is wrong, and it, you can't fake it, you can't da-da-da-da. If there's not, you know, David said, my cup runneth over. I mean, you know, when your cup runs over, it spills out. You can't help it. You can't help it. Either we have what we would call periodic intake, you know, every three to six weeks, we sit down and have a banquet and just oh, stuff our face and, you know, usually out of panic more than anything else. <laughs> you know, and then we feel real good and we go three to six weeks without eating anything until we're anemic and dying. And then we, and that's not normal. I mean, there are other principles. That, well, that's a principle, but another principle is moderation. Another principle is balance, and to understand that, and to, and to, and to, um, you know, whether it's emotions or anything, food or anything, you don't go way high and then way low. You don't do that on any plane in any level. You learn, you know, say, well, life's real boring that way. No, no, no. That doesn't limit the you know, the, the things of your personality and whatever, but I'm talking about as far as being led by those things and those things being the government of your life where that, you know, you, you know, your life is either a soap opera crisis or it's, you know, the most wonderful love story in the world, you know. And, um, you know, I, I truly believe that God gets a lot more pleasure out of those who can daily, daily. The Lord told me years ago, it wasn't going to be the rich people. It was going to be the daily givers, the consistent givers that would, would help support a church. And he, he told me that, and then I saw it to be true. You know, because you're always praying for the big one. You know, oh, send us just two people that make a million dollars a year and tithe off of it. You know what I mean? And... Um, you know, actually, we've had people that in this church were a part of this church that are now making over a million dollars a year, but they happen to leave the church sometime back. Well, you know, I don't get a tithe off of a million dollars, and you know what? Don't need it. I'm not. I'm not even depressed about that. Well, why'd you bring it up? Just to let you know that that happens, and it don't matter. I mean, 
we're still going. You know, there may be a chance that the millionaire may not be going in five or six years. I mean, I don't know. But we're going to go because we're going to stay with God's pattern. We're going to stay with his life. We're going to seek him. We're going to put him first. And we're going to find that life breeds life. And we're going to find that that which is faking life is going to be like a mask that just corrodes and corrupts and falls off and will be seen for what it is. And that scares everybody in the whole world. Oh, God, don't say that. Encourage me, brother. You know, well, who knows? Maybe your mask needs to fall off. You know, because there are some people that really, they think that's, you know, they think they're safe and they're not safe. And better it fall off now and you fall on your face and find the Lord and be seen as an utter wretch than you wait and stand before God, having faked everybody, including yourself, out all your life. You know, <laughs> you know to me, it's just real sad. I don't even want, I wouldn't worry about that. To me... Everybody is brought low. The only way you can ever be exalted is to be brought low. I mean, it's ultimate. It's going to happen. I just, I accept it. Well, okay, you know, instead of trying to like build it up higher so my fall will be really hard, you know.